Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Bare Necessities Podcast. We're glad to have you back with us this week. And this week, we have a really exciting episode. We're going to be joined by Nicholas Mariano of the Chicago Audible Podcast, talking a little bit about Patrick Mahomes' contract, and then getting into reviewing every single NFC North team and how the Bears stack up against them. But before we get into the show, we want to announce the winner of our Instagram giveaway. And that winner is The Shy Bears News, which for you guys who don't know is actually actually owned by a previous guest on the podcast, Chris Malby. Um, So congratulations to him. We will be doing many more giveaways into the future. Um, So make sure to follow our Instagram in order to take advantage of those. Our Instagram handle is at Chicago Bear Necessities. We do a lot of news and updates there. And it's just a great way for us to connect with you guys. You can message us, tell us what you want more on the pod, tell us what we could improve on. And while you're at it, why don't you go ahead and leave us a rating and review in the bottom of Apple Podcasts. A written review helps us the most, but a five-star review just with the stars, no written review also helps us tremendously. And you know what? If you are that big of a fan of us, why don't you also subscribe to our YouTube channel? Just type in Bear Necessities Chicago Bears podcast and we'll be one of the first results or click the link in our description we link it at every podcast so thank you guys so much enjoy the show and look out for another podcast releasing next monday hello everybody and welcome back to the bear necessities podcast this week we are glad to be joined with one of our second third guests of the show nicholas mariano of the chicago audible podcast how are you doing this week nick doing well how about yourself Not too bad. I know we're both very excited to have you on the show. As I said prior to the show, you guys have been a big inspiration for us. Uh, Definitely one of the gold standards when it comes to Chicago Bears fan podcasts. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the Chicago Audible? Yeah, so um, I've been a part of the Chicago Audible now going on my my fifth year. Um, Yeah, we just try to provide the best content, something new um, when we can and able to. But it's it's awesome to hear that, you know, that we we are people that you guys look up to. And we've gotten that from from other Bears podcasts as well. But, yeah, just trying to give Bears fans that that coverage that they absolutely desire. I, I feel like Bears fans, regardless of where you're at in the season, if they're losing bad, whatever, they want some kind of coverage. It might not be the best kind, but it's just something that Bears fans need, and it's awesome that you guys are doing the same thing as well. Yeah, 100%. And I think that um, the biggest thing is that for right now, there isn't a whole bunch of high-quality Bears podcasts. And even that being so a couple of years ago, um, I remember when I first started kind of getting into podcasting, I would see you guys. You guys always had a super high-quality podcast. So for any of our listeners who are aware of uh our podcast, go ahead and check out the Chicago Audible. They'll probably be one of the first podcasts to uh, pop up when we type in Chicago Bears podcast. Um, So definitely excited to have you join the show. The first thing that we're going to kind of be breaking down today is Patrick Mahomes' huge $503 million 10-year contract, something super unprecedented uh, from a player, a quarterback, whatever you name it, even an athlete. Um, Something that the Bears possibly could have had, but um, we're not going to dwell too much on that. Nick, why don't you give us your first thoughts on Patrick Mahomes' $503 million contract? Yeah, at first when I heard it, I'm like, wait, do they just add another couple of zeros at the end of there? Like, this is an enormous contract. Like you said, Austin, it's just something that we haven't really seen before. But when you look at what Patrick Mahomes has done in his young career, and then you see the numbers associated with it, it's it's worth every penny because he is that good of a quarterback. He can change. A, he can win games by himself. Obviously, he has a great team around him, but he can capitalize on every single playmaker. So you look at the money, and he could reach up to that five hundred to five hundred three million dollars. And knowing pa- Patrick Mahomes and what he's already accomplished, who knows? I mean, it wouldn't be surprising if he somehow gets all that just because of who he is as a quarterback. And you see, like, the video that he posts. I mean, I think he's already going back, working out in the gym and just getting prepared again. So it's worth every penny. And I know a lot of Bears fans, and I think including myself, are just like, man, what could have been? And, you know, obviously we remiss about that a lot. But it's uh, it's definitely a huge win for the Chiefs and for Patrick Mahomes, obviously. Yeah, I, I think it's worth every penny, personally. I mean, how can you not? He's shown just about everything you want to see from a quarterback that's this far into his NFL career. And, you know, as a Bears fan, I just kind of look at it and be like, man, I wish there's someone that I want to put uh, on a 10-year contract like that. 
but you know that's the way it works out and i'm sure a lot of people will get worried about you know athletes kind of taking a break or taking it easy once you know they get that big payday but like you said, he's already back at it, working on the gym. He's not someone, you know, that I think that's going to take his foot off the gas. I think we're just going to continue to see a high degree of excellence, you know, for this whole 10-year contract. Honestly, it's I could see it working out very well for him. And, you know, honestly, these long-term contracts, once you get to that longer or the end part of that contract, it actually becomes a good deal as long as he's still performing mm-hmm. well. Absolutely. And I think you hit on something very important, both you guys, actually. It's that with his level of play it might be a little bit of an overpay in the beginning but towards the end once you get like three years in it's going to be uh it's it's just going to be a a great deal for the Kansas City Chiefs especially locking up a player that long I'm sure the Chiefs they were looking to get that long of a contract so they can maintain this 50 million dollar a year contract obviously the length of a contract tends to be more beneficial for the team especially when you have less guaranteed money uh, which it seems like it hasn't came out exactly but it seems like the guarantees might be centered in the first three to four years which is nothing crazy for a quarterback in this day and age the one concern I guess I do have with this contract and by the way before I I say this the Kansas City Chiefs they absolutely made the right move by giving him this contract there was no way they should have let him hit the open market or whatever and you know when you have a player this good they kind of dictate whatever they want Um, but I guess the one concern that I would have is that Patrick Mahomes has been surrounded by quite a bit of talented weaponry I think two all pros one pro bowler he had Kareem Hunt with him Sammy Watkins a a bunch of guys right and this contract for the next, you know, foreseeable future before it really does become like a steal on the market, they're probably going to have to move on from a lot of these guys. So it's definitely going to become more of the Patrick Mahomes show, kind of what we saw uh, with Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay. So if I'm playing devil's advocate, that would be the one concern I would potentially have. But um, yeah, they, they still made a great move by uh, giving them this contract. The only move they could have made that would have been better is to trade him to the Bears but I doubt that they would <laughs> that they that they would want to consider that. But um, I think that just wraps it up. I mean, obviously, what could have been for the Bears is always going to stand out here. Um, but today, that's not the focus of the show. Of course, we are breaking down the NFC North, going over each team, how their offseason was, their grades, and kind of comparing the Bears to their divisional rivals. Um, I remember when we did this show last year. Um, I think Reese had ended up being turning out pretty spot on, even though our record prediction was well off. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that I think that it was a pretty decent comparison. So, you know, what? why don't we start off with the hometown Bears? Of course, let's start off with our losses. We lose Leonard Floyd, Prince of Mukamara, Trey Burton, Taylor Gabriel and Kyle Long. Most of these guys were not overly productive this past season. Obviously, Prince of Mukamara started for us for a while. However, uh, he has dealt with constant injuries in his term with Chicago. Same with Kyle Long. Kyle Long, I could even argue that he wasn't playing that well when he was healthy. But in free agency, we go and we add Robert Quinn, a uh, huge signing, Jimmy Graham, was not a fan of that one, I, I have to say. Demetrius Harris, Jermaine Effetti to play guard, Ted Ginn Jr., Tashawn Gibson, and of course, Nick Foles. And then in the draft, we go over to draft Cole Komet, Jalen Johnson, Travis Gibson, and then Kendall Vildor and Darnell Mooney. So Nick, why don't you go ahead and start us off with how you grade this Bears offseason? Yeah, so when I was looking at just what the Bears had done, what they lost, and just accounting everything, you have to think that the Bears did get better here. They upgrade at some positions. The one that I think was a head scratcher for everybody, especially when you look at the money, was a Jimmy Graham sign, Jimmy mm-hmm. Graham signing. Just the money associated to a player that was kind of on the downward trend, right? But you look at the tight end situation for the Bears, it honestly is probably an upgrade just because of how mm-hmm. bad the play was there. So I think what I ended up when we did, uh, a f- just a recap of the offseason and what the Bears did. I think I gave it a B plus just because mm-hmm. there's, there are some factors that you got to obviously equate here. It's like with Nick Foles, it, does he actually win this quarterback competition? Is he going to be the guy that they hope he can be? And then you look at like a Leonard Floyd and Robert Quinn. Robert Quinn's an upgrade. They Cleo Mack finally gets his counterpart that will maybe take away some of those double teams and let him play to the best of his ability. And Nakeem Hicks in that situation, that front seven – is a pretty nasty one. And then with yeah. Prince of Mukamura leaving um, and you get Jalen Johnson there, I think what we saw from Prince in the first year, first year or two, you know, was decent. He he was a capable starter, but last season 
you saw the downward trend again just because of old age and just not being able to stay in the best man-to-man coverage. But Jalen Johnson, I think, is going to be a stud for this Bears defense. Just with quite, put that pass rush with him and then learning from veterans around him, I think it's going to be a seamless transition from him. And then you look at finally the safety position into Sean Gibson, haha, ha Clint Dix. I think with Tashawn Gibson, it's going to allow Eddie Jackson to play more of that single high safety and just being able to play that robber position as well, just to pick off some of those things that are coming underneath from obviously route, um, just route um, combination and things of that nature. So I give it a B plus. The Bears got better. We just got to see how this all really comes together. And I think the big one too, just in coaching, is you got to see what Juan Castillo can actually do with this offensive line because mm-hmm. the only addition really to that offensive line is Jermaine Defetti. So this is the same group that really underperformed in 2019, and they're putting a, the Bears are putting a lot on Juan Castillo to really right this ship and to hopefully get this running game, this offensive line correct for 2020. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I'll, I'll go ahead and start giving my grades now, and then Reese uh, will toss over back to you. But uh, for my offseason grade, I did give us a B plus. I was a huge fan specifically of the Jalen Johnson signing. Um, obviously, being at USC, I got to see him play in person. And uh, he was always someone that consistently stuck out and even played through injuries at a very high level. Many would say that he might have went top 15 this past year if he wasn't playing through injuries because that's just how good he played. Um, when it goes back to Jimmy Graham signing, I was very aggravated with the Bears when I saw that was their first free agency move. Um, the money, it, it was not worth it. I have hope that maybe Nagy can get something out of him. But what I have to say and what I like what the Bears did this offseason is that as a unit, the tight end unit is very overpaid and we, we put a lot of value into it, but it's a good unit, like together, like all together, Jimmy Graham, if he was the sole solution here, I'd be very mad, but having him, you know, obviously with Cole Komet and then Demetrius Harris and some of the guys that we had in the past, you know, that's not a bad unit and it's going to be much a huge upgrade. And even if Jimmy Graham only gives us what he gave us last season, that, that's an upgrade for the Bears. That's a, that's a clear upgrade for the Bears. So You know, I like it. Obviously, you said Juan Castillo. Uh, I'm a big fan of his uh, offensive line coaching. I think that he runs a lot more of a modernized offensive line system rather than what Harry Highstand did, which is kind of a more traditional, um, mainly meant for like ground and pound back what he did with uh, Notre Dame and everything. Uh, Obviously, still a good head coach, but I can see why the Bears decided to move on. I'm also um, obviously very excited for uh, uh, Dave Filippo. Uh, in the quarterback's room, I think that him, Nick Foles, it, I hope that we can get some sort of competent quarterback play. I, I'm, I'm confident we can get some sort of competent quarterback play. I think we have a ton of players uh, returning from injury. And again, as you were saying, defense is looking to be stellar this year uh, with the return of Akeem Hicks. You know, Eddie Goldman isn't going to be as injured. Uh, obviously, we have we just have an abundance of riches there. I'm very excited. I'm, I think that the Bears are going to improve. I'm unsure at to what degree, though. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I have a pretty similar outlook to both of you. I'll give them a solid B. The way I see it is that, you know, where the Bears lost some of these key players, they improved, they got upgrades at those positions. We talked Prince of Mukamar for Jalen Johnson. I think that's an upgrade. I think Trey Burton for the Cole Komet, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Graham package, you know, Take the Jimmy Graham contract as you will. Not the best thing in the world, but if we're looking purely at what performances we're going to get out of him, I think that tandem is an upgrade over what we had with Trey Burton and what our tight end cast was <laughs> in the past year. Um, and I think Leonard Floyd for Robert Quinn, you know, while you are losing someone that was younger, maybe had a little bit more potential, but you know, we didn't really get to see the best part. We didn't get to see too much consistency as play with injuries with Leonard Floyd. I think Robert Quinn is an upgrade. You know, we are getting someone finally alongside Khalil Mack. You know, that as you brought up, where you know it's it finally gives or brings up the opportunity for Khalil Mack to be free from some double teams. So mm-hmm. I think this defense is going to be excellent. The offensive line is still definitely worrisome. 
you know, Jermaine Effetti, the only one being brought in, you know, we'll have to see what Juan Castillo does. I think that's the narrative that you two have both kind of pounded in so far. And also, I think the reason why I went with a B instead of a B plus is because, you know, as I brought up on multiple podcasts beforehand, I think, you know, even not picking a quarterback late or picking up some kind of younger quarterback prospect in an undrafted free agency or something like that. I, I think that just, just makes me have a little bit more of a negative outlook because I'll feel really confident with the Bears offseason when they're finally doing some real quarterback development. And mm-hmm. I know that Nick Foles, you know, has been there. Hopefully can teach Trubisky a little bit, but we'll just have to see how it works out. Yeah, and I think one final point I want to make when it comes to Jermaine Effetti is I'm very excited to see him switch back over to guard. When he was coming out of Texas A&M, he played mostly guard, and that's where I kind of thought he would play, but when uh, the Seattle Seahawks obviously drafted him, they were kind of operating their system based on a need basis, and so he went and popped out to tackle. Um, obviously a very athletic player, but tackle clearly a more technical more advanced position it takes a lot more to handle guys on the edge especially when some of the best athletes in the nfl are on the edge so i have high hopes for him but we still are missing that consistent uh starter and reese and i have touched on in the past the possibility of signing larry warford i think that would still be a great move and have jermaine effetti kind of be our primarily primary rotational backup offensive lineman so Moving on, we have the Minnesota Vikings who have lost quite a bit of talent. This is a pretty much a completely new team outside of Kirk Cousins. We have stuff we lost or they lost, excuse me. I don't want to associate myself with any Vikings fans. Um, they, they lost Stefan Diggs, Xavier Rhodes, Trey Waynes, Linval Joseph, Mackenzie Alexander, Josh Klein, which was a big loss, Everson Griffin and Trey Waynes. Um, not many notable names signed in free agency, but in the draft they went in, they brought in Justin Jefferson, Jeff Gladney, two really high quality prospects, Ezra Cleveland at the tackle for tackle position. And one last player I want to throw in there is Troy Dye out of Oregon, another great inside linebacker. I gave their offseason grade an A minus, but Nicholas, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Yeah, so it was just interesting to see how that all played out for the Vikings and seeing you you said the read those names there, Austin, of the guys they lost. Those are big contributors for this Vikings team over the years. So it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of recompensate what they lost with what they gained in these draft picks and things of that nature. But look, from me outside looking in and obviously not looking at the Vikings as much as I cover the Bears. I have to see how this plays out and see what these young guys can actually do for a Vikings team that, what, not too long ago was playing, uh, you know, in the NFC Championship. But mm-hmm. I think with this Vi- with everything they've lost and such key contributors, I'll give them a CC minus right now, and I have to wait and see. Uh, obviously, we, we've seen what Kirk Cousins can do at times. It's not very much against the Bears, and when it comes to bigger, better competition, it's like, where's Kirk Cousins at? So, and then basically a lot with every single team but the Bears with that first pick in the draft with Lions, the Vikings, and obviously the Packers, they drafted guys to replace capable players. You look at Justin Mm -hmm. Jefferson, Stephon Diggs. You look at Jordan Love, for, and then Aaron Rodgers already there. And obviously, uh, Akuda with, um, why am I, uh, blinking on the corner's name? Yeah. Oh, uh, for, uh, Slay. Who, yeah, Slay, Darius yeah. Slay. So it's like yeah. all these guys are now being – they're replacing very capable guys. Like anybody would take those players, but they're replacing them. So we got to just see the initial impact that these rookies can have on this on this team that, look, it's been somewhat consistent, but it hasn't gotten over the edge there. So um, I, I'm interested to see what these this new Vikings team, really, this new, def, this new defense too because – a lot of those are veteran players that have made a lot of plays for the Vikings over the years, but now it's almost an entirely new secondary, so we'll see how that all plays out, and it's just going to be interesting to me. So I'll give it a C, C-. minus. Now, I have to, um, for my offseason grade, the reason why I gave them an A- minus is because I appreciate that the Vikings had a realistic view on their team. They obviously got rid of a ton of guys who are were really high quality in the past you know really well-known names Linval Joseph Xavier Rhodes um, Stefan Diggs these were all key staples of that NFC championship team that ended up losing to Nick Foles may I add but um, that they that team it's it, it wasn't this the players weren't the same players um, they 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 definitely aged with time and I think that the the Vikings this offseason 
which is I'm surprised the national media doesn't really seem to get this. I they they willingly kind of blew up their team. They decided that hey, yeah. we're going to go through like a mini rebuild these next couple of years and hope that we can add enough talent that will be competitive again in the NFC North um in the next coming years. And hey, they kind of timed it properly because guess who just drafted a quarterback in the Green Bay Packers, so Aaron Rodgers is out of his way too. So, looking forward, it was a very smart move for the future. That's why I, I gave them the A minus. I appreciate when teams can say, this isn't working. Let's try something different. However, this team definitely got worse this offseason. They are betting a ton on young players. Um, they're, they, they got some good young players. I'm a fan of Justin Jefferson, Jeff Gladney too, but, um, they're, they, they're not going to be the, the top of the NFC North, like some national media analysts are claiming that they will be. When you draft players, you have to expect that it's going to take, you know, two to three seasons before they're performing at a high level. Now, obviously, there's players like Eddie Jackson who just completely blew that away or, you know, even guys like um, Darius Leonard. And and, and there, there are exceptions, but for the most part, that doesn't happen. And betting on, you know, four or five, six uh, young players to take over that mold and perform at a high level, I don't see it happening. And besides that, I view that the Bears got better, so um, and the Bears already obviously beating the Vikings two times for the past two years, um, or well, four times total. It's not, I don't have a great outlook on the Vikings season this year. I think that they'll probably finish third, maybe fourth in the division, um, with the Bears obviously placing above them. Yeah, the way I gave them a B, uh, just like I gave the Bears a B. Um, I think that the draft picks they brought in, Justin Jefferson, I like that a lot. I think that Stefan Diggs works very well in that offense, but at times he kind of didn't, he wasn't consistent enough in, in some ways. And I feel like, you know, he had his huge moments, of course, you know, with that big play against New Orleans when uh, Case Keenum was still the quarterback there. But I think ever since Kirk Cousins has became a quarterback there I've kind of put a little bit of a cap on him I I think that this team can be one that can compete against just about any team however I don't really trust Kirk Cousins in a lot of the big situations even with the fantastic receiving receiving that he's had with Adam Thielen and Stefan Diggs and now what I believe will continue on with Justin Jefferson I think what they did on the defensive side of the ball I don't mind it too much overall I think you know like Nicholas brought up they got rid of a lot of huge names that have done a lot of big things for them in the past I think a lot of people can kind of see that players like Xavier Rhodes are losing a step or two. They don't really have the same edge that they had quite, you know, three to four years ago. So I think that they made some smart moves, but in the end, you know, like you said, Austin, I think they actually got worse and took a step back. And there has been a lot of national media hype, but I think people that get to watch the Vikings pretty consistently can understand that, you know, maybe we shouldn't raise our expectations too much. Mm -hmm. I think they can mix things up in the division, but... You know, I think it's a B for this offseason. It's really, you know, like Nicholas said, it's a kind of wait and see with this team. We don't really know exactly what's going to happen. One thing that I want to kind of bring up that I didn't mention in the first read of their offseason is they also extended Kirk Cousins this past season. And I was very surprised to see that considering that out of his three years with the Vikings so far, he's really had one competent season or two years, two years or three years. How long has he been with the Vikings? I think this was the second year in this past. Okay, year. yeah. So, so one out of two years he performed well. So, in, in my head, I would have rather, you know, obviously had them see him play out his contract, kind of see if he is going to be that same guy. Um, I understand that they did want to keep him under contract because when you know quarterbacks obviously hit free agency, it's a whole different issue. But again, that's what we have this uh, the the franchise tag for. That being said, I I do understand he played at a better level, but we still didn't see a Kirk Cousins that was, you know, overly good in tight games. And specifically when you look at the Bears, he looked just flat out pathetic against the Bears in his first in his first performance. And that's been a continuous issue with the Packers. He's also struggled. And when you have a quarterback that can't beat two of the teams in the division, that's a huge red flag to me. Um, and if you're again, if you're looking to kick kick the can down the road a couple of years, why not think about drafting quarterback, especially in a draft that's going to be historically good in this upcoming draft? So that, that, that that's just some final comments for the Vikings overall. Good good off season for the future, not the best for the time being. Now let's look at the Lions, who you know a lot of people have really been propping up their offseason as the best in the nfc north now i don't think i agree with that but let's go ahead and get into it 
for their losses, they obviously lost Graham Glasgow, uh, Ashawn Robinson, Darius Slay, huge one, Devon Kennard, Ricky Wagner, and Snacks Harrison. Um, in free agency, they brought in, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his first name, but Vatai, uh, Jamie Collins, Nick Williams, Danny Shelton, Desmond Trufant, and J. Uh, Ron Kurs, excuse me. Um, then for the draft, they went out and they got Jeff Okuda, which he's a stud. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to front about that. He, he is a great, great, great prospect. Probably the best college football cornerback prospect I've seen in the past five years, at least. Um, and then, then they went out and they also got DeAndre Swift, another good running back, Julian Okwara from, I believe, Notre Dame, and then Jonah Jackson. Nick, how, how do you feel about the Lions this season? Yeah, I mean, just looking at what, obviously, the losses and their additions here, I, I think DeAndre Swift was one I great great player at Georgia, and I know, obviously, they have on Johnson. It's just, will the Detroit Lions actually use a running rushing attack, you know, with <laughs> Matt Patricia there? So it just seems like that has never been something that, you know, Matthew Stafford can really count on. And with Matt Patricia, ever since he got to, you know, the NFC North and with the Lions, you're kind of wanting to see when that defense is finally going to step up. It hasn't. He's won nine games in two seasons, nine, 22 and one as a head coach. So just looking at the offseason, I think they did make some good moves. It's, it's just whatever I think of the Lions, it, it comes back to the civil. It's the Lions. They're just not <laughs> really, I don't, they're just not capable of like competing for some reason. Something holds them back, but they did add some good players. I will give them that. So, you know, I gave them a solid B for what they were able to do. The Jeff Okuda pick. Love Jeff Okuda, but you're replacing Darius Slay. So it's, we'll see. We have to wait and see what Jeff Okuda, where if he has a career like, um, you know, Darius Slay, that's going to be fantastic for that organization. But it's just a, it's a player at the same position for a player. And I think that obviously that will, that can work out in the long run. He's younger, all, all mm-hmm. those good things, but we want to wait and see with that as well. And then Julian Aquara from Notre Dame, I really like that pick as well for the Detroit Lions. I think he's an edge rusher that I was looking at um, just with, with the Bears, what they could have maybe done. But, mm-hmm. yeah, and there, there's a couple of players that, as I was kind of going through this list of transactions that the Lions made, I'm like, okay, the Lions may be going in, in the right direction for once, you know. But uh, I give them a solid B for, for their moves this past season. Yeah, and I think you hit on something really important that, you know, maybe not a lot of national media analysts, people who aren't as close with the Lions, um, really notice. And that's that Matt Patricia has been, quite frankly, a disaster in Detroit. Obviously, they, they move on from him being a borderline playoff team consistently, and he falls down to having them be one of the worst teams in the NFC North and in the NFC at all, quite frankly. Um, consistent struggles with Matt Stafford, hasn't really had a, a, a solid quarterback play, which again reflects more on Matt Patricia than it does on Matthew Stafford. Um, but overall, when you have players like uh, Snacks Harrison and um, Darius Slay who are consistently saying they dislike their head coach and speaking out on their head coach, that's an issue. That's an issue in and of itself. So it's going to hold the lines back a lot. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Matt Patricia scheme wise or as far as a person goes. Um, not a huge fan of their offensive coordinator either. Um, but, but that being said, Okuda was a good pick. Andre, DeAndre Swift was a good pick, but honestly, they're pretty much at a wash with everything else. Honestly, this entire offseason could be just completely a wash. I mean, Nick Williams for Ashawn Robinson, that's pretty similar. Um, Danny Shelton for Snacks Harrison, not, not too different. Desmond True, like these are, these are moves that are, you know, they're, they're rotating players in, but are they really improving the team? Probably not. And Jeff Okuda, in order to play at the level of Darius Slay, um, played at these past couple of seasons in his rookie year, he would win defensive rookie of the year if he, if he did that. It's going to be, it, he needs to reach super high levels to even give the Lions the same performance as what they were getting the year before. DeAndre Swift, I'm a huge fan of him. Can't say, uh, can't say more than enough about him. He, he's, he was a running back who I was huge on this past draft. And I think that he, in a way, will, uh, complement what they already have going on there in Detroit. And maybe he'll be able to bring them some sort of consistency out of the run game. But overall, I, I, I give this offseason probably like, you know, a C because it's, I just don't see it. They didn't lose out on a whole bunch of talent, but they didn't add a whole bunch of talent either. 
Uh, obviously, again, huge pick of Jeff Okuda, though. And I think that the Lions are probably going to end up finishing last or third in the NFC this NFC North this coming season. Yeah, you know, like you said, I, I, for me, it's kind of a wash, this their offseason transactions. I think, you know, you guys touched on the good ones with Swift and, and Okuda. I gave them a C minus. I think that this is a team that's, you know, at least under the Patricia era, has been stuck in a rut. They're kind of just one of those typical mediocre teams where they have a lot of good talents in, in some areas, but can't really extract the most out of them. I think Matthew Stafford, you know, maybe he's not on the right side of his career anymore, but I, I think Matthew Stafford is someone's career who's kind of been, unfortunately, wasted a little bit. You know, he's not technically sound. He's not a perfect quarterback, but I think he's someone that's you know, played at a pretty high level, but this Detroit team, they just haven't really been able to give him everything that he needs, including a, a competent running game or a, or a, sometimes a great defense to boot. But I think that they have pieces in place like Kenny Galladay at wide receiver. I think the wide receiving core is pretty good. You know, Obviously, they need more from the running game. I think losing Graham Glasgow, who's a solid interior offensive lineman, I think that one might hurt him a little bit, especially when they should be looking to get more productivity out of that run game. Everything on the defense to me is kind of kind of a wash. I think Akuda has potential to be maybe a little bit more versatile than Slay was. I know there's sometimes some kind of coverage schemes, especially you know what we saw with under Matt Patricia that didn't work the best for Slay. But maybe Akuda can you know perform better there. But we don't know how much time that will take if it'll be come right on this first season. So to me, I, I think that they're going to stay in pretty much the same position that they were. Um, you know, either that last place or third finish. Honestly, I think it would probably be last place for them. And I think that Matt Patricia is going to have a lot of explaining to do. He's going to have to fight pretty hard in order to retain his job. Absolutely. So finally, let's move on to the rival Green Bay Packers. Uh, they have had quite the, I guess you could say, interesting offseason this this previous year. Obviously, with the losses of being Jimmy Graham, Blake Martinez, and Brian Bulaga. Uh, can't really underrate those players, but then in free agency, adding Christian Kirksey, Devin Funches, and Tremont Williams, and then obviously in the draft, probably the most indicting, Jordan, adding Jordan Love, A.J. Dillon, and Josiah Deguara. You know, as it was all happening with the draft and stuff, uh, I was like, keep doing you, Packers. You are just really screwing <laughs> this up for right now. I mean, the Jordan Love pick, I think even Packers fans will say, they hated it at the time, and I still don't know how they feel about that pick. Obviously, it's a down, you know, down the road kind of see what happens with Aaron Rodgers, but this team just won 13 games, was in the NFC Championship with the 49ers, you know, got, got whooped by that rushing attack that the 49ers have, but they're still there. If they're not trying to get the best out of Aaron Rodgers now, I don't, I, I just didn't, I just didn't get it. And then you don't draft a wide receiver. Like, I think Aaron Rodgers, what, a, a week before the draft was saying it'd be nice if we can get some kind of wide receiver. Packers didn't give him that. <laughs> they gave him AJ Dillon. I could see maybe the Packers just wanting to really establish that rushing attack at, at Green Bay for years to come now with, uh, Dillon. You have Aaron Jones, Jamal Williams. So three headed monster there at the rushing attack, but, not adding any wide receivers, and then you're really putting a lot of pressure on Christian Kirksey to, one, just stay healthy to replace a Blake Martinez. Good linebacker, when and if healthy. That's the big question with him, Christian Kirksey. So it's going to be, like it, like you said it, Oz, it's interesting, those moves that they made, because I think a lot <laughs> of Packers fans obviously didn't like them, but Bears fans here are thinking, all right, this, this could work out for now. We'll see years down the road, but I just I didn't see the – the Packers really getting much better. Like obviously, maybe the AJ Dillon peak, peak, uh, pick works out. Jordan Love works out down the road, but not now. If they were looking to compete with the 49ers or some of the best teams in the NFC, they didn't do it. Now with this draft, now with the offseason moves, I think they got worse, and they're just hoping that you can get a more Aaron Rodgers magic. But this has to be for me a bear for a Bears fan a plus, but for Packers like a C minus here, just because mm -hmm. of what they what they lost and how they tried to compensate adding, you know, other pieces. It's just a wait and see uh, similar to the Vikings. It's like a down the road kind of thing. This little rebuild, like you mentioned Austin earlier, it's they're kind of in that mode, but they're trying to still be able to compete. But like I said, we'll have to wait and see. So C minus for me. So before I get into my grade, I kind of want to preface this with uh, a couple of thoughts on the green Bay Packers. The first being, 
there's a possibility that the Packers view this previous season that they had as a fluke and that they got a little bit lucky uh, due to a lot of uncharacteristic years from players and just uh, a, a huge hole, obviously, in the NFC North and in, uh, in, in, in the division altogether. But I don't know if that's the case. But if that is the case, this offseason makes a lot more sense. So adding Jordan Love, you think, hey, maybe we can compete a couple years down the line. A.J. Dillon, do we really want to give Aaron Jones uh, a new contract that's going to take up, you know, 16, 15, 16 million dollars? It's, it's, it's understandable in that sense, but I'm going to operate under the assumption that they don't, they have some sort of internal confidence and that they don't believe that is the case. If that's the case, then the grade on this offseason is a D minus. It's, it's a really, really poor offseason. I like Jordan Love um, as a prospect for the Bears for the reason that we were low on draft capital. He was someone that we, we could have possibly got if we wanted to, to add another young player, um, add another person in the locker room. However, that being said, Jordan Love, when you look at the past, you know, five drafts, you look at the past four drafts, he is a very low ranking prospect comparatively to the rest, and especially when you look at the the quarterback class next year there's a really good possibility that five starting quarterbacks might come out of this this next coming draft um just tons and tons of talent loaded into the first round and and you can really get a competent starter probably even at the high second round potentially potentially so we look at the packers even if they are taking that forward looking perspective why would you not wait to draft a quarterback this coming this coming draft right why 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 would you decide to trade up when you have one of the lowest picks and try to draft a quarterback who you don't even know like relative to the other quarterbacks in the past couple of drafts how good he is he's a huge question mark and I, i'm sure that they did have some sort of confidence in him to trade up for him but again like you're you're, you're picking a quarterback at probably the worst position you could especially because we all know that aaron Rodgers. Sure, he might not have 10 years left in him, but he can pro- he can go three, maybe four more years, five years possibly even. So there was no rush to get a quarterback. That being said, I almost expected this move because I don't know if you guys remember previously in last draft, they were really big on Drew Locke. And what ended up happening is that the Denver Broncos jumped them one pick and drafted him. So it seems like uh, their, their GM, Brian Gutekunst, actually had some sort of really strong desire to draft a quarterback. And I don't know if that's supposed to be like a message to Rodgers or, or what what it's supposed to be, but they they were not in dire need of that. And they were in more dire need of adding some competent weapons to their offense because quite frankly, the offense left uh, a lot to be desired last season, especially when you have a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers. That offense needed to be even better when they invested so much money into it and so much time and effort. So ultimately... I, I, I truthfully believe when you look at this draft, the Packers got worse this offseason because a lot of the names that they got rid of and brought in, a lot of it is a net negative. And then also, um, they didn't, even if it is a net negative and in the draft, they didn't really address any positions of need, which again, you can argue that that's not a way to draft. You're supposed to draft best player available, but they also didn't draft best player available. They, they drafted a lot of really weird potential <laughs> scheme fits that, you know, they make sense in the sense of that they are a scheme fit, but in the position they're drafted, they don't really make that much sense. Um, and ultimately, I see this as really putting a big asterisk on the Packers this coming season. I, I don't know if we can guarantee that they will win the NFC North or not. Yeah, so I, I feel a lot of the same ways. I gave them a C plus overall because... I'm not going to fault them too hard for going after Jordan Love. I mean, this is something that it seems like the Packers like to do and kind of having someone in the stable so they can kind of, you know, get some kind of grooming process going in before they before they throw them out to the Wolves. But, you know, I think that maybe this year wasn't the best year for it. You brought up next year's draft, giving a lot of opportunity, you know, even in a later first round to go out and pluck another great quarterback. So, you know, there's a little there's some question marks there. I think one positive bright side, I think that Devin Funches is someone that is a dark horse possibility to like thrive in this offense, you know. If we really want to go like low and like this is someone that might just come out and, you know, surprise a few people by, you know, performing decently, I think he has the possibility to do that. But 
there's still holes in that wide receiving core that need to be filled that you know hasn't really had since he had that whole Jordy Nelson, you know, Donald Driver, I'm blank Greg Jennings kind of combination where he actually had some some receivers to throw to. So and that's going back quite a few years. So I think that you know the offense that was kind of a kind of a wash. They did lose Bulaga too, which I mean he's had some injury issues, but kind of you know the people they brought in to fill in I mean we don't know if we're going to see the same level of performance you know losing Blake Martinez sure they're going to they brought in Kirksey to try to fill that but at the same time it's a defense that kind of had an up and down season last year and you know I think a lot of the Packers strength last year was you know they did start using the running game better and that's something I think LaFleur did well but at the same time they need to find a good way of striking that balance and utilizing Aaron Rodgers' explosive, you know, ability to just break a game wide open with that running game and then hopefully kind of use that to create some stability for the defense and just not putting them out on the field too much. So I, I gave them a C plus because I think I don't want to fault them too much for thinking ahead, especially in the quarterback room. But it's not something that you can really say the Packers got much better at all. And, and we were going to see a record regression anyway. They weren't going to do 13-3, and three, but... Now I just don't know where they're really going to finish now, especially with this kind of meh offseason. Absolutely, and I, I guess that goes into um, the next two questions that I'm going to pose. And the first one is, how do we see the division working itself out? So who's going to finish first, second, third, fourth? And then also, how many years does Aaron Rodgers have with the Green Bay Packers? Nicholas, if you want to start off, go ahead. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, look, we just – put all the factors into where we th- why we think the Packers where they won't be at 13 and 3 again but they still might be the number 1 team leading this mm-hmm. NFC North division right you have Aaron Rodgers you have a chance and Matt LaFleur I think had his ups and downs but I think he's going to work on that rush- rushing attack I think he's going to want to get like you said Reese just with the 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 big play capabilities and then you can come back with you know rushing for a couple of times and getting a good chunk on the ground. So the Green Bay Packers, I think, are still the lead dogs. But you look, we just talked about the rest of the division, and we all kind of agreed here, the Bears got better. And if they actually have competent quarterback play, this is a whole new story with the Chicago Bears in 2020. This is a defense easily can be top five. They have the mm-hmm. piece to do it. If you have competent quarterback play to you know add to that, this team won eight games with, you know, just awful, atrocious offense. Yep. What can they do with competent quarterback play? So I obviously covering the Bears, being a Bears fan, I have them second, and then I will go it's look, the Vikings, like we we all said, they didn't add anything for now. It's probably down the line. And then it's still the Lions. We're still waiting to see from them. But I think they will have a better season than last year, which is not saying much, or even <laughs> the year before that. So I'll you have hope. the Lions at third and then Vikings finishing uh, last in the NFC North. And then your second question about Rodgers, how much does he have left? Look, he has been slightly regressing, but slight regression for Aaron Rodgers is still better than a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL and still capable enough to beat the Chicago Bears, you know, one twice a year, right? Once or twice a year. So I think he's still got three to four years with the Green Bay Packers. We'll see if the Packers still want three to four years with Aaron Rodgers, though. I think Jordan Love just going up and getting him kind of signifies that's not the case. Maybe he wants to learn, obviously, from him. But there's going to be a time and place where Aaron Rodgers is not the quarterback for the Packers. I think Bears fans can rejoice, but we'll see how that ends out with Jordan Love. Obviously, right now, nothing that Bears fans should be worried about, but we'll see come down the road. So three to four years for Aaron Rodgers, I think. Yeah, and for me, I, I, have, I have to give the benefit of the doubt to the Green Bay Packers, obviously having... Aaron Rodgers on the team but I don't think that that is set in stone again we I I believe that the Green Bay Packers got worse this offseason especially in comparison to the other teams in the north Um, and I also believe that you know there's they they played a very easy schedule last year and they're playing a first place schedule this year and when you look at the Bears schedule the Bears if they don't get 10 wins on this schedule they had a worse season than last year and I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that to be to to be completely honest is if the Bears don't break 10 10 wins this year it's it's a huge issue because the schedule is just so easy it's like the fifth easiest uh, when it when you look at Vegas odds um, so yeah the Bears they need to perform better and I think that they have an opportunity of 
getting a really, really good record this year. So I'm not even going to put the Green Bay Packers in stone there. But in order to, you know, just maintain integrity, I'm going to put the, the, the Chicago Bears in the second place spot. And then following that with the Vikings and Lions, I'm just so, so low on uh, Matt Patricia. He is he he is a big issue, and I do not I cannot put any faith in teams that have that sort of coaching issue, and then also kind of a front office issue. They don't really bring in that great of talent ever, so I, I it gives me uh, maybe a little bit maybe it's a little bit unfair, but when when you know front offices continuously show that they don't bring in that much talent to their team, it makes me hard to be optimistic on their off season moves as well. And then for Aaron Rodgers, I think. I'm a little bit more pessimistic uh, than than you are, Nicholas. I, I I think that we're looking more at probably two years. And here's here's the one asterisk I put on that as well. I believe that the second that Aaron Rodgers goes down with a major injury, if Jordan Love performs even somewhat well, then he's he's getting the starting job. And when we just look at the NFL, the reality is that very few players drafted in the first round unless they're just absolutely horrible like Paxton Lynch was very rarely do they do they sit more than a year like i i can't remember i don't think a single first round quarterback has sat more than a year in the past like 7 years maybe maybe longer than that with the exception of Paxton Lynch who was god awful didn't even really see the field um but again Jordan Love when you look at it and you compare it to what is the current trend in the NFL. I think Aaron Rodgers probably has two years left with the Packers at least. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think I'm going to surprise the world. I'm going to put the lions at the one spot. No, what? I'm just kidding. But no, I'm <laughs> kidding. But, <laughs> I thought you were serious for a moment. I was like, <laughs> no, I was like, no we're going to have to cut the podcast and we're going to have to talk about <laughs> this before we move on. <laughs> yeah, no way. I, I'm, I'm going to stick with the trend. I think that the Packers have to be in that that one spot really until proven otherwise right i i, I agree with both y'all i like the bears at two the uh, there's always that big question mark on the offensive side of the ball with the quarterback position and honestly that offensive line too so that makes me really kind of scared to put him anything higher than two and and a little timid to put him at two to begin with but i think that the bears have such a strong defense that i think with any kind of passing just average offense this year i think they can survive and and manage to get that two spot and hopefully contend for a wild card position so that's the way i see it i see the vikings at three and i'm not exactly sure how this will shake out with them and the lions this coming year but i'm hard pressed to think that they'll do worse than the lions i think that they have enough pieces in place there for them to still succeed but i do think they'll see you know a little bit of a fall off especially with kind of the massive sweeping changes that they made and with the Lions I just need to see something under Matt Patricia to kind of make me think that they can get back to where they were about three four years ago where they were contending at the top of the division contending for a playoff spot and you know had a, a pretty solid defense and you know good offense to boot so I need to see something more along those lines before I ever think that the Lions can really dig themselves out of that you know that hole of the NFC North and as for Aaron Rodgers, I don't see him getting, you know, you drafted Jordan Love, right? He's your first round quarterback. This kind of hits a little bit what you were saying, Austin. But you draft someone in the first round. I don't see a reason why, if you do that, that Rodgers gets any kind of extension, right? So that puts mm-hmm. his shelf life at two years. I think that Rodgers will more than likely, unless something catastrophic happens, some kind of career or season ending injury, that you know, he gets under under those that two year period. I just don't see him gain an extension unless, you know, he turns his career or just starts playing out of his mind, right? Like just wins the next two Super Bowls. <laughs> something where you basically can't like even think about getting giving him away, even though he's already spectacular. But with Jordan Love in the stable, I don't I could see him getting restless and if it comes to the point where they extend Aaron Rodgers to be starting quarterback, then you really have to look back at that love pick is unless they can get some kind of good compensation in a trade or he's really willing to sit around there for four or five years, you know, then that pick just becomes a waste. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. This could, this is likely, in, in my opinion, at least I can say, I believe that this pick is going to what end up, what's going to end up really 
getting Brian Gutekunst and other pieces in the Packers front office uh, chipped out, if I'm being completely honest, because I think once the Packers lose Aaron Rodgers, it's going to become a lot more apparent, apparent the lack of ability to fill roster holes and the, the, the just genuine in focus on what the team actually needs. And then also their lack of willingness to really give players second contracts, third contracts, unless you are the starting quarterback or Devonte Adams. Um, I think that's been a consistent uh, issue with the Packers. And a lot of people think that when, you know, when they brought in Brian Goodkunst, that was a complete regime change. It, it really wasn't. He was from the same regime that kept most of the same pieces. So he, he is of the same, pretty much the same mindset of a lot of the previous Packers regime. And it's, it's kind of long overdue, um, for some sort of move there. I, I do think that Matt LaFleur can, has a, has a high potential as a coach, but still not a huge fan of Brian Goodkunst at GM. So. That is going to end up concluding our thoughts on the NFC North. But before we go ahead and wrap up the show, Nick, we have one question that we ask every single guest who comes on our show, and that's give us one hot take about the Bears that you have for this upcoming season. I don't know if this is a hot take. It might be, but just with everything that's going on in the world with now, COVID-19 and everything, and seeing Mitch Trubisky actually getting reps with his wide receivers and getting the continuity established, I, I I initially said once the Bears sign Foles, he's going to be the week one starter. I wouldn't be surprised, and I'm going to say it now, and we'll see about maybe a month from now if there's a preseason, that Mitch will go out there and start week one against the Lions. It's a scenario that if you look at the first four weeks of the season, that Bears schedule, like you were saying, Austin, earlier, is shaping out to be an easy path to maybe get hot. And maybe that's what the Bears ultimately want, to get Mitch on a hot start. But I'll say this now. We'll see about in a month from now that Mitch will be the week one starter for the Bears and who knows what will happen throughout the course of the season. But starting against the Lions where he's actually mm-hmm. had success out of all the teams. Oh, it is the Lions. So um, it would be a good start for Mitch Trubisky, but I have him pegged as a week one starter right now. I could absolutely see that. and I think that is what is shaping out to be one of the more likely scenarios. I was really down and out on Mitchell Trubisky, especially when we added Nick Foles. I was thinking it's Foles, Foles, Foles. I'm going to say that I think that there's a potential that Nick Foles doesn't even touch the field this season. And I, I the reason why I say that, call me crazy, but Mitch Trubisky has always been someone who performs, you know, he pre- he performs better in like practice and he, he, he he's doing all the work, but he never seems to be able to translate it onto the field. And in this kind of weird COVID this weird COVID, like no fan season, there's going to be a lot less pressure on players. And it's going to give players who, who tend to do a lot better in practice and uh, who, who tend not to be able to perform as well when the lights are on them, a lot more opportunity to really transmit from practice to the field. And, you know, I, I think that there is a possibility. Is it likely? Probably not, but um, definitely could see Mitchell Trubisky starting this coming season. Reese, any comments on that? No, I think that I was definitely of the impression that once Nick Foles got here that he would certainly be starting. And I feel like I've definitely walked that back in the past few weeks just because it <laughs> seems like, you know, Nicholas brought up a good point. Just kind of the way the trend of things are going with kind of how this offseason has been, it really has just opened the door wide open for Trubisky to take that starting position and really kind of really have to make Nick Foles have to take it back, you know. So... <laughs> You know, we'll just see how it plays out. But, you know, if this season it's going to be kind of weird, going to be kind of different, you almost feel like you might as well give the chance to Trubisky anyway. You know, that we know what Nick Foles is, and, of course, we signed him for a reason. But, you know, why not give Trubisky one last chance and see if he can really turn it around? You know, I'm still skeptical of what he can fully, what his potential is at this point. But, you know, I'm here for him to prove me wrong, that's for sure. And you know what I what I always say is that the best case scenario for the Bears this coming season is that the Bears win the Super Bowl, and the second best case scenario is that we have zero wins and get Trevor Lawrence. So maybe Mitch Trubisky can be instrumental in doing either of those things. Uh, well, I, I guess we'll have to uh, see. I'm very excited for this season, Nicholas. Thank you so much for joining the podcast. Uh, why don't you one last time for the listeners uh, so that they can check out your podcast immediately when they finish that? Uh, just link link to your uh, Chicago Audible. Give us your plug. 
Yeah, so you can uh, find us at the Chicago Hour on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. We'll actually be doing a podcast tomorrow on the offensive line and the running backs, our countdown to camp series. But, yeah, we're just going to continue trying to find ways. I'll try to find stories to write about in this offseason. None of us will be at training camp, but you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at the Chicago Audible. Thank you so much, guys, and bear down. Thank you. Bear down.